On this episode of Narcissist Apocalypse, we talk with an abuse survivor named Rhea, and Rhea was raised by an invalidating narcissistic father. It's a story of conditional affection, witnessing abuse, perfectionism, survival mode, extended family sexual abuse, and betrayal. Welcome to Narcissist Apocalypse, everyone. I am Brandon Chadwick, and with me today, we have Rhea. How are you? I'm doing pretty good today. Thank you. Well, thank you for being here with us today. You're going to share your story. It's a family story. But before we get into your story, if you want to share your story, that's a lot of stories I've just said. If you want to share your story, everyone, please do go to our website at NarcissistApocalypse.com, top of the page. There's the button that says Guest Form. When you click on that button, it takes you to our Guest Form page. Please read all of the instructions and either send us an email at NarcissistApocalypse at gmail.com or fill out our Guest Form and press the Submit button. And please do send everything in the format that we ask for. And today, Rhea is going to share her story. It is a family story, and it is a story that evolves um, throughout. And the story is not an easy story to tell. It's not an easy story to listen to. A big warning that there is physical abuse uh, mentioned in this episode. And also a big trigger warning for sexual abuse in this episode. There are a lot of dark secrets on the father's side of the family that you will eventually hear as the story evolves as it goes along. And Rhea was a victim of this abuse. So a big trigger warning to everyone for physical abuse and sexual abuse before we begin. A lot of people might recognize their family uh, in this story, so uh, be careful when listening to this episode because this episode could really re-traumatize you uh, for the people that have gone through this, the sexual abuse specifically. So with all of that uh, being said, uh, I just want to thank Rhea once again for being a guest and being here today to share her story. It's not an easy thing to do, and without further ado, Rhea... The floor is now yours. Thank you for the introduction. Um, I guess where to start would probably be the origin of my parents and their upbringing. So um, my mom comes from, they both come from pretty large families. My mom has, um, she's one of six siblings. She was... I think the four siblings, so kind of the middle child in this scenario. And um, she grew up in a very abusive household. A lot of the abuse coming from her father, my grandfather, sounds like most of the physical abuse was directed towards my mother in that house. There wasn't ever really any type of accountability held towards my grandfather. Um, my grandmother kind of you know would watch it all happening and didn't do anything about it didn't stick up for my mom um my mom was actually a lot of times the only one in the whole family kind of calling out the abuse and and it wasn't until I think maybe she was around 16 years old that a school counselor told her you know you can get help from the police with this situation for what your dad is doing to you. Cause I think they noticed some of maybe the bruises on her and um, they gave her a card. I think the police actually came to her school and said, you know, if you have a problem, you just call me and you know, we'll, we'll handle it and we'll take care of what's going on with your dad. And so she just came back home one day and said, you know, dad, you're never going to be able to continue to do this. Cause if you do, I'm just, I'm going to call this number and kind of get you taken care of. And um, I guess past that point, the physical abuse stopped, but there was still a tremendous amount of neglect and, you know, all other sorts of abuse that just 
kind of got swept under the rug and never addressed in that situation. Never, um, never, never discussed again with my dad. I, a lot of the stories I've heard about my dad kind of come through more so of what my mom has told me that he told her in private. And a lot of that would be, um, a lot of neglect from what it sounds like from his mother. And, um, she, she was the main narcissist of that household growing up with both of the parents for what it sounds like she would leave my dad alone in his room in the dark, just crying for hours until he stopped, but never, you know, comforting him or never showing any type of really nurturing affection, just kids in that family were a nuisance, just more a problem, which is, you know, kind of infuriating why I have children if you're just going to completely <laughs> neglect them and um you know there's no emotional nurturing whatsoever but i i think there's still a lot that i i don't know that i haven't been told so when it comes to your family are both of your parents the abusers or are um is one uh, the primary abuser One is the primary abuser would be my father. Um, He was the narcissist in my family unit, being my mom, my my dad, obviously, me and my brother. Um, My mom was the enabler in that situation. There's a lot, you know, in regards to my relationship with my mom now that I've kind of been uncovering some bigger stuff. There's some things, you know, that kind of come up where, um, you, you grow up and you kind of realized how messed up all these things were. And you, and you look back at times where you would kind of voice, you know, your concern growing up, um, just things, you know, my father would do that were really scary as a young child. He was never physically abusive in the way where he hit me, but he would make it clear that I should be afraid that he might. I should be afraid that if I get too out of line, that that's something that's definitely going to happen with him kind of, you know, just jumping in on me and my brother out of the blue, like, you know, clapping his hands or kind of making us flinch to just kind of be scared of his presence, honestly. And there was a lot of times um, where I would tell my mom, even at a very young age, I think I remember the first time I told my mom this, I was six, I would just say, you know, dad scares me. I don't, like when he does this, it scares me. And she would say, um, well, my dad did stuff like that to me when I was younger. And uh, we just learned to laugh about it. Like we just, that was what would happen. And we just learned to laugh about it. And then he wasn't that scary in our minds anymore. And so something kind of clicks in your little six-year-old mind to where you say, I guess this is just a part of life even though, you know, deep down, you don't, you still don't feel safe. You kind of have to trick yourself into thinking, oh, well, this is funny because he, he gets mad and he, he throws things or he yells, you know, we just have to, we have to laugh about it because really you're being told that by an adult. So you think that they, they sure know what's the best thing to do. And here's a point where your mom can be a safe person for you, but your mom minimizes your feelings, sweeping things under the rug because she's running off of her own uh, trauma responses to things. And in the process of doing that, she's not protecting you uh, or giving you a voice in her role as the enabling parent. Exactly. Exactly. And it was, it was a very strange thing too, because in all other aspects, my mom would defend me and fight for me and protect me. But when it came to my dad, it was like, she had this blind spot, you know, probably because of that deep trauma bond that she was entangled with, with him, you know, and like you said, keeping the family unit combined, um, 
and just that old pattern of sweeping things under the rug because what you learn in that system is that if you're the one bring up the things people don't want to talk about which is you know just the truth of the abuse going on you're going to be the one who really gets targeted and attacked and that becomes very clear from a very very young age that that is the dynamic of my my family unit itself but then also that my dad's side of the family which is something that is always around you know we would see my mom's side of the family for different events but I'd say with my dad's side of the family we're always going to be there for Christmas we'll most likely be there for Thanksgiving if we're not going off somewhere for my dad's birthday every summer we're going to go camping so there's just there's there's this look to the outside world that this is a very put together organized family with you know great traditions and things that you know make us make us seem like the perfect family but from the inside it's just a disaster there's no space to express yourself ever there's no really room to be a kid I look back at old home videos of a Christmas gathering with my dad's side of the family and it's a typical you know (laughs) a typical Christmas for us which is like no music playing like kind of everything looks nice there's nice decorations everywhere you know a lot of food on the table but everything feels cold and there's a lot of you know yelling at the kids to stop playing and laughing was like a big issue that would come up a lot if you're laughing if you're having too good of a time that's kind of a problem you know where my nana just kind of handle that or different members of the family just I don't think they knew what being a kid should be like because I don't think my dad's side of the family really got that at all. So when they all had kids of their own, we had 12 grandchildren on my dad's side of the family. And when we all got together and got kind of rowdy or, you know, or just giggling or having a good time, um, like they took offense to that in some way. It was just very strange. Like they all expected little five-year-olds to act like adults because that was more manageable for them. but. It's just very, um, very frustrating environment to grow up in as a kid. So uh, what was the relationship between your parents like, I guess, on a day-to-day basis? My parents' relationship with each other was very volatile. I remember them fighting more than ever, you know, getting along and having a good time. I can't think of anything that they would do that was a common interest between the two. A lot of the times it was just a lot of um, usually late night fighting in the kitchen. Now, now with hindsight, knowing what I know now, um, there was a lot of gaslighting going on from whatever type of conversation they're having. There's a lot of gaslighting going on from my dad's side where whatever my mom was trying to discuss with him or calling out with him there was a lot of you know just cussing her out saying like you don't know what you're talking about like my dad would also you know pick on my mom in a way that it would kind of pass off as you know oh I'm just I'm just joking with you we're just having a good time but it's a lot of you know little picking at insecurities Things that if she said to him, he would kind of lose his mind over. But for some reason, you know, he gets a pass for getting to, you know, make little jabs at her and and pass it off as humor. And then if you say anything about it, like, oh, you just you're too sensitive. You don't can't take a joke or whatever. So. So eventually you hit early adolescence. So what happens And how do your roles within the family change or um, take shape? I think it's funny when I think about the roles and, you know, kind of narcissistic family units, because in this circumstance, I feel like they definitely fluctuate a lot. A lot of the affection my dad would give towards my brother and I really depended on 
you know, how we were doing in school or just, you know, societal achievements, how we looked to the outside world. And in certain circumstances, I think I'd, I would feel a bit like the golden child when it came to my brother and I. My brother and I had a fight or argument or disagreement as, you know, little children. I feel like my dad would more often just take my side without even assessing what the fight or the argument was about. But when I would see my dad fighting with my mom or yelling at us to try and get something or whatever it was, a lot of the times I would fight back. I really hated the way he spoke with us. And I, it's a very confusing thing too, as a child, when you're, you're learning how in school to talk to people, you know, talk to others, how, you know, treat others, how you wish to be treated. And yet this one person in your family somehow gets to treat people any way they like, and, you know, dependent on their mood, dependent on whatever, you know, they feel. And so a lot of the times I would as a very, very young child, you know, elementary school age, I would be fighting back with my dad. You can just feel this sense that something is just not fair. So a lot of times I would be fighting back. And in those cases, I feel like that's where I was trying to kind of treat it as the scapegoat in that scenario. And so, you know, a lot of fighting back, gaslighting, all of that going on at a very young age. And, um, and and part of me just thought that was normal, you know, because a lot of, like I said, my mom talking about her relationship with her father seemed like this is just the normal thing you do where your dad comes in yelling as a six or seven or eight year old child, like should not have to be defending themselves or their family against somebody, you know, so cruel and so um, domineering all the time. And um So one incident that happened when I was younger that really showed me, you know, just how violent my dad could get um, was, this was New Year's Eve, I want to say maybe the year 2000, um, and I was six years old, and my mother was just tucking me in for bed, um, going to sleep, kind of doing our routine. I think we had a party going on that year. So we had a lot of neighbors over and we're still downstairs in the house. And as she was tucking me in, my dad came to the room upset over something, who knows what. It seemed like in my mind at that age, I thought he was upset over her spending so much time putting me to sleep. That seemed to be what was happening. And so she got frustrated and went out into the hallway with him. And I think I was peeking through the door or looking for my bed, but either way, I could kind of see what was happening. And I don't remember much of the argument that happened in between then with them. But at some point, my dad hit my mom across the face really hard and at that point in my memory, I kind of black out. I don't remember what happened right after that, but I think the police got called because I remember there being the, you know, not the sirens going off, but the lights of the police car. I remember that kind of shining over my blinds. And that's, that's the part after where I don't have too much memory of that. They didn't address anything of what had happened at all. We didn't, discuss the incident and it just looked like they overnight had kind of made up and were over it and so in my mind as a kid I'm just thinking okay well I'm glad my dad's not going to jail I guess they're getting along now so I guess we don't have to talk about it anymore but from that instance you really feel protective over your mom and that you know creates a really helpless feeling as a kid because there's nothing I can do to protect my mom from my dad but 
I'm still able to see kind of this darkness about him, the thing that she can't really see. She can't see clearly because of, you know, their bond with each other. Um, I felt like I was able to see that very clearly, but also had to suppress that at the same time because I knew if I brought that up at any time around him, he would get very volatile, very defensive. And so you just kind of learn to quiet it and not and not speak about it, but it creates for a very strange relationship growing up as you get older and and kind of a resentment towards my dad for getting away with all of this abusive behavior towards my mom and there being no type of consequence for it, you know, just kind of this cycle going around over and over again. So that was an instance where I really saw how, how, where his violence can go and where it can lead to. So uh, would you ever hear your mom make excuses for your dad's behavior? Even though, you know, my mom would say a lot, you know, I wish he were home. I, I think that would fix a lot of things. I think she kind of put that strain on their relationship in regarding that, you know, saying that, oh, it's because he's gone so much. That's why, you know, our relationship isn't what it should be. Um, and so I think you start to believe that kind of narrative going around that it's, oh, it's just because he's not there as much, you know, if he were here more, it would be, it would be better. And a lot of his anger and aggravation also got blamed on the fact that he did not like his job. So a lot of this, you know, kind of narcissistic narrative, whether he started it or I don't know how this got, you know, kind of developed and something my mom would say that got brought down to us was that, you know, he doesn't like his job. So if it were something that he liked, something that he really, really wanted to do, he would be a lot happier and he wouldn't be so grumpy all the time, you know, grumpy, really being abusive, but the, every, everything was diluted Would never mention that he was abusive. It was just, he's, he's mean, he's crabby. He's, you know, he's snappy, but never, never, you know, I never had any of the, uh, I never heard abuse and my father in the same sentence ever at all growing up. And what is your relationship like with your brother during this time? And um, are you friends or are you strangers? Do you talk about this stuff or is this stuff silent? I think the re- the relationship I would describe with my brother is, I'd say we're we're fairly close for, you know, having gone through all of this, but I I don't talk to him about any of the things I have learned about, you know, how abusive my father is. I think there are probably more things that I know about and have seen maybe as the older sibling that he is still not aware of or does not remember, has not seen. Um, I don't really know how to talk to him about it. I hope one day I can really share all of this with him um, because he is a very understanding person but I think just at this point in time you know he still has a relationship my, with my father I I do not and since he still has a relationship with my father I think there's just certain things he's just not awake to yet and I've been there before I know I understand you know the kind of process that goes on in your head around all of that. So um, I I do hope one day I can kind of share all this stuff with him. So just a little question about your dad and Mm -hmm. his pathology, let's say. Mm -hmm. Was he neglectful of everything within the home? It was all kind of up to your mom, what kind of goes on inside the home? Yeah, absolutely. And was he toward you mostly not interested in the sense of uh, kids are there to be um, 
seen, not heard? Yeah, definitely. Okay. So, and he is physically, he's physically abusing your mom. Mm-hmm. Um, and when, uh, but he's the type of person who is, there's physical abuse to your mom going on, but as far as the kids go and his role with inside the home, um, it is non-existent. And he's someone who's more about vanity, would you say? Absolutely, yeah. A vanity and how the outside world perceives and looks at him. So he's doing all of these things. Your mom is a prop. You are a prop. Your brother is a prop. And inside the home, yes, there is like abuse and physical abuse going on. But a lot of the things that are uh, going on as well are just complete neglect and uninterest of all of you in a way. Um, You know, because his biggest thing is how the outside world uh, perceives him. And that's what he is mostly focused about. Absolutely. Yeah. It felt it felt like we were accessories to him. Everyone was having kids and getting married, so he needed to have kids and get married. And he, you know, I don't even like to say he showed conditional love cuz nothing he did was about love you know, but they have conditional affection towards you. So you're doing something I like, or you're wearing something that I picked out for you and bought for you. Uh, I'm going to show you that I really care about this, but there's never any time where I'd be alone with my dad, where he would even look at me. (laughs) He was just always very distracted you know, I say that in quotations because um, he just was never there, you know, never emotionally there before even iPhones. He, you know, had whatever Palm Pilot or, you know, flip phone and he was just engulfed in that. And so a lot of that got passed off of like, oh, well, he's working, you know, he's stressed, but it's it. he he could have, you know. And that that was just all an excuse for the emotional abuse that was going on, but he just never saw me, you know? And it's so frustrating to have that be so normalized because it just makes you feel like you're not doing something right. And it's also very confusing because my my mom, like, in, you know, kind of felt like she had to make up for that. You know, she really, like, was always there with my brother and I was very attentive was my mom's whole world was just taking care of us doing what we wanted. And that was great, but you're always still kind of grabbing towards the parent that won't ever really sit down and talk with you or, or play with you or anything we're doing together. My father and I has to involve something that he wants to do. We're going to a game because he likes baseball. We're going to, you know, a race car thing because he wants to see this. But it's never like, I'm going to take you to a kid movie because you really like this movie because he has no interest in that. So there was never any anything we would do together unless, wow, does this benefit him? It's not going to really <laughs> help his life in any way in the way he views I just need a second. <laughs> it's hard when you, like, you know, things are messed up when you're younger and then you get older and you're like, wow, that's more messed up than I thought. Ah. <sighs> okay. So the transition from elementary school to middle school is really tough. I think I think middle school is a tough time for everyone, but I didn't realize how much of you know the internal struggles I had going on in middle school were really revolving around my home life and the anxiety and depression I felt, you know, living in that house. 
a lot of that kind of turned into physical symptoms in middle school. I would get sick a lot, like physically sick, um, vomiting, throwing up. I think like at least once a month I would get sick. And I think now looking back, knowing what I know now, I think a lot of that was my anxiety. I had a lot of anxiety about not being good enough in school, not, you know, matching up to this image that is acceptable to not only my dad, but his whole side of the family, especially his sister and my grandmother, who are both narcissists, along with him. So is it fair to say that you are trying to live up to the expectations of others and a massive weight is constantly on you that is just killer? Like it is holding you down and uh, all of your decisions are going through a million different thought patterns in your head overthinking everything to your anxiety level um, and no decision is easy uh, no outcome no, of everything is easy and yeah. you are going to be someone who for most of your life probably right now as well is very hard on yourself mm-hmm. um, does all of the work for everyone else because they instilled those uh, expectations of perfection and all of those things at a young age and how you are outwardly showing yourself to everyone else. And once you're in that um, cycle, um, it's very hard to find a way out of that cycle because you don't know that you're allowed to make mistakes and that by (laughs) making mistakes is the only way to truly learn but you got thrown into a situation where mistakes are not allowed and that puts the weight of the world on you and then you have a problem fair yeah you summed up my whole entire life (laughs) yeah from a very early age I mean elementary school I felt like I was a perfectionist and I thought this was just this was just a me thing I didn't you know, realize how that family dynamic was influencing all those, you know, thoughts of, I have to be perfect because in their eyes, even perfect isn't good enough. You know, there's, there is no space to be human really at all. You're just expected to be the best at anything you do, because if you're anything else, you're just, you're nothing to them. And for a long time, I was in honor roll, you know, advanced classes. And some at some point in middle school, I just couldn't do it anymore. I think I also started to realize more of what I wanted to do was art. I loved being in musical theater. I loved songs. I loved music, which is the complete opposite of what anyone in my dad's side of the family finds, you know, acceptable because it's all about, well, how are you going to make money off of that? And that's not something, you know, that's ever going to amount to anything. They'll, they'll love it if, you know, they get to take the whole family to a show and they'll show up to the show and it will look really good and they'll get you flowers. But behind the scenes, they just, you know, that doesn't, that doesn't amount to the societal, you know, pillar of what you need to do to be a number one citizen. It's just kind of saying you want to get a face tattoo over your whole face. Like that's the, which if you want to do that, go for it. I'm all for it. But (laughs) to them, it's, you know, it's just kind of the worst thing you could sign yourself up for. It's, it's a hobby, but it's not anything serious, anything worthwhile in some way to them. And just so everyone knows, you do not have a face tattoo all over your face. <laughs> I'm thinking about it. <laughs> um, yeah. Oh, one one lyric I did want to share that really I feel like encapsulates 
this feeling in middle school of, you know, feeling like you're just kind of looking for some something to latch to, 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 to be still, to be calm throughout all this chaos of this environment. But there's a song from, the song is called Into the Ocean, but the lyric is, I want to swim away, but don't know how. Sometimes it feels just like I'm falling in the ocean. Let the waves up take me down. Let the hurricane set in motion. Let the rain of what I feel right now come down. And let the rain come down. And this was a song I listened to all the time in middle school, you know, in my headphones on my iPod, kind of walking around, feeling like, oh, I'm just an angsty teenager. You know, this is just, I guess, the way teenagers feel when really this was a lot of pain, a lot of pain that. I didn't understand because nobody around me could tell me or explain to me, you know, or validate for me how wrong this behavior was and what was going on was abuse. So you just, you just kind of feel sad and you think you're sad for no reason. Like they tell you, you know, any, anytime I would bring up any type of, well, my, my dad's really mean. It's like, well, you know, he, he pays for your things. So you should be, this is all coming from his side of family. He, he's a great father because he, he pays for all your stuff and you're spoiled. If you're, if you get all those things from your father, who's such, you know, such a great guy and you can't be grateful for that, you're just spoiled. I'm like, I don't think I said that at all. I think I said, he's mean. (laughs) I think, think I'm trying to bring out this abuse from him, but there was just a lot of you know, whenever you bring up something that is about um, abusive behavior or bad behavior on uh, your dad's end, you are brought with the you are an ungrateful person response. Your dad is a good provider you are ungrateful and it doesn't hear what you are actually saying. Mm -hmm. And they're going to the one trait about him that he's doing, which is providing for his family, um, which all parents should (laughs) do. Yeah. (laughs) Um, But uh, they are dismissing your feelings and then giving you this kernel of truth, which is the reality. This is he is providing for the family and he is a good provider. But uh, with that providing, you're not allowed to go against him. Mm -hmm. And things, I assume, are a whole held over your head in a lot of occasions, I'm going to assume, and that um, nothing comes without a price. Mm -hmm. And that price, uh, if something is paid for, there's an emotional uh, price to be paid for that, to be held over your head, or, you know, it's better in a lot of cases here, like, to not accept that I don't want this thing because by not taking it something can't be dangled over you Mm -hmm. everything comes with strings attached it's all just about control and how he can control try to control this family unit unit because apparently we're all just here to make him look like a great father He can't even be an okay father, you know? He has to be the most amazing, best, greatest dad ever. When in reality, he is the worst. He is absolutely just a nuisance to be around. And uh, yeah, so a lot of the purchasing was done to kind of win favor. You know, if there was a dispute that happened an argument he might show up with like a little gift as a way to say hey we're not going to talk about this anymore this is this is the gift of silence you know without having to say that that i think was a a huge tool he used to continue on his abuse on us so eventually your parents do get divorced so what happens there 
this part of the story has multiple layers and should also mention too, my parents got separated when I was a lot younger, when I was around nine years old. Come to find out years later, um, my dad had had an affair on my mom. I did not know this at the time. I found out a while after when I was a lot older, but, and when I say there's a lot of layers to this, um, around the time where my parents decide to divorce, some interesting behavior happens a few months before that, that I'm noticing before I'm, you know, aware of, of what's going on with my mom and dad. But my, my dad and his sister start hanging out a lot more than usual. And what was really happening at that time was both my dad and his sister decided together, say, hey, you know what sounds great? Let's both divorce our spouses at the exact same time <laughs> while we're both um, having an affair, which I found out about later, a few weeks after my parents announced that they're going to get divorced. We were doing a cabin retreat with my field hockey team. We're up at my cabin. My dad had offered to, you know, bring us up there, stay at a cabin nearby and like kind of watch all the girls that are there, kind of keep an eye on everyone, make sure we're not burning down the house. That was kind of unusual because again, he really wouldn't take his time out of his schedule to do something like that. So I'm like, interesting. That's, that's nice of him to offer. So we go up there. He takes a photo of all of us on the couch and I grabbed his phone to send myself the photo. And I look at his phone and as I'm grabbing, you know, the photo, some messages start to pop up from a contact with just a letter A, no name, just a letter A, already suspicious. And I see one text that pops up that says, I love you, babe. And I'm like, hmm, interesting. So I click on it because I want to see what's happening. And turns out he's in a full-blown relationship with someone sending pictures of me, which just felt very eerie and creepy to be sending pictures of the woman you have you were having an affair with, you know, months before you decide to divorce your spouse, as I find out later. And so I tell my friends what's happening. And I decide I'm going to call my mom. I'm going to ask her if she knows that he has a girlfriend. Because I, I don't know. Like, had, is she aware of this? What's going on? Like, is this an affair? I don't know what's happening. So I call my mom and ask her, do you know that dad has a girlfriend? She says no. And I said, okay, well, this is what the situation is. I see texts from like months ago. So I told my mom, I'm just going to put you on the phone with him. I don't want to talk to him. So my mom hands him the phone. He's outside and he's making hamburgers. And then he comes in and he says, I need to talk to you outside. And I say, no, I don't want to talk to you. I just want you to go. He's like, no, we need to talk outside. I go outside with him. I'm, I'm the one who should be mad. <laughs> and he, he's the one who's mad at me about finding out about his affair. And, and this is going on for te about 10 minutes. I'm like, just please, can you please go? I just need you to leave. I can't handle this right now. This is too much for me. I need you to go to where you were staying and just leave me alone. And finally, you know, he huffs and puffs and goes off. So what do you think the reasoning was that he came up on the trip in the first place? Oh, well, come to find out that woman that he was having an affair with lives up there she lives out of town maybe 15 minutes away so it wasn't just you know I'm gonna take my daughter on a trip with all her friends because I'm a great dad it's like the woman I'm having an affair with lives up there and that's actually how he met her was by going up to our cabin at some time when you know he wasn't with his family deciding to just so if your uh, thing with the, the lacrosse people, or sorry, if your thing with the, the, with, with the field hockey team was an hour uh, the other direction from this place, from wherever your regular home was, the odds of him taking you was slim to none. Oh, exactly. Yeah. Oh, just never, never be a thing. 
he would find he would ask my mom or just probably just you know never plan to help in that situation at all it was definitely just to go see his girlfriend absolutely so how did your relationship and life change from this point so this is the only time i had gone no contact with my dad. It's the only time I could have because he wasn't living at the house. So I actually had an option to, you know, he wasn't going to come back and be in the house. So I saw that kind of as my break to be free from him a bit. The way you grow up when you're taught that your feelings are a nuisance to other people or a burden, it feels like you just tell yourself, oh, well, I can get through this on my own. I can get through this on my own until it becomes absolutely impossible, just too, too much where you're, you already feel like you've been at the end of your rope to where you're, you're like, I have fallen off my rope. And, um, that year I also learned how quickly the rest of my family, speaking about my dad's side of the family, will turn on me when I am no contact with him. Because for the most part, growing up, my aunt, I would say, saw me as another child. Like, rather than my brother and I being like a niece or nephew to her, we're, we're an extension of her because of her relationship with my dad. For them, you know, for whatever weird, strange dynamic that's going on between them, where there's a lot of, at some times we're competition with her children, but then on sometimes, you know, when she makes a costume for the musical I'm in, then all of a sudden I'm, you know, I'm her golden, you know, child. That's not actually her child. <laughs> She's holding up on this pedestal. But when I decide to go no contact with my dad, um, something really shifted in that family dynamic where all of a sudden I can feel the the wrath of my aunt's loathing you know that mask is slipping off a lot faster where she's a lot shorter with me she's you know obviously very offended that I would go no contact with my dad because he is the most amazing caring you know loyal <laughs> all these things he's not but in her eyes you know that's that's who he is and also she she is simultaneously doing the same exact thing he is so um by me having offense to people having affairs on their spouses that's apparently too much for her to handle so but then um i have a, another aunt my dad's other sister and says uh you know you should really talk to your dad you should really, you know, work on this relationship. And I'm a lot of times when people would kind of approach me like this, it would just make me freeze because I'm wondering why doesn't anybody approach my dad and say, Hey, why doesn't your kid want to talk to you? No one, no one will ever approach him, but everyone feels that they can come to me and say, you know, life is too, whatever thing, life is too short. He's going to die one day. You'll regret this being the last thing you say to him, that you don't want to talk to him. It's really hard for him. You know, this is really a hard weight on all he's going through to have a kid who doesn't want to talk to him. And so that starts being, you know, just agonizing on top of all this to see the truth of everything going on. And yet all this weight is put on me to just get on with it. Like nothing's happening or go on, like, you know, just sweep it all under the rug. Like, what are you doing? Like, this isn't, this isn't acceptable in our family. You know, we all have to stay together because if you, if you start not talking to somebody, you know, who knows what else is going to come spilling out from the rug we've been trying to sweep things under for years and years and years um eventually I do end up speaking with him again um a really unfortunate um thing happened on my mom's side of the family where my cousin passed away this is in January the following January after 
all this has happened and um the way my cousin passed was really tragic he was on vacation and um he was in a hotel where there was just faulty wiring and the hotel caught on fire and he passed away so it was just very unexpected and very sudden and I was home that day I had an off period from school and I heard my mom downstairs just um crying like screaming crying to where I knew somebody died I just didn't know who but my first thought is oh it's my dad my dad died or you know your mind just kind of goes to a few different people and when we found out it was my cousin on her side of the family I didn't know what to do because my mom was you know understandably pretty inconsolable and so I just thought to call my dad because I I couldn't I didn't know what to do I couldn't take care of it and I called him and he came over and I just you know under all the pressure of everything and and kind of the the dynamic that had been going on I just cried and just told him like I thought it was you and was really upset and um that's where you know he started to be in my life again because I was kind of going off of what everyone said you know he's gonna die one day you'll feel guilty if he dies and and you you didn't have any type of relationship with him and so that that's where we start to have contact again and uh, where the relationship continues from that point so eventually the divorce gets finalized and your dad ends up selling everything and reneging on a deal he made with you so walk us through that so um past this point you know it's a strange thing between seeing the dynamic of my parents relationship you know through a divorce side because a lot what i hear from a lot of people is you know you think being married to a narcissist is bad you know being divorced or going through a divorce is even worse but I think a lot of what had happened when my mom was divorcing, my dad was just wanting it to be over. So a lot of what got split was not an even split financially speaking. So my dad got the house. My dad got our second house, which was our cabin. And, you know, it just feels like my dad wanted to start a brand new life. And that meant, taking away everything from before so the cabin got sold everything had to go didn't ask if we wanted to keep anything from it all the furniture was going to stay he just wanted to wipe his hands clean of it and we still had our childhood home for a few few years because my brother was still in high school and then when my brother was getting ready to leave for college my dad said you know I know what happened with the cabin, um, with the house. I told him, like, can you, can you put up for rent? Like you have enough money. You're so well off. You don't need this. You know what I mean? It's not, it's not like you have to do this financially. You, you can, I'm like, can you just rent it out so we can keep it? And he says, yeah, I'm going to, I'm going to rent out the house. Um, so, you know, we won't sell it like how we did the cabins. We're like, okay, okay. That's going to happen. And it was really emotional seeing my brother leave for college. It was second year of college when we were selling it. And he was just in tears. And he came to me and he was like, please, please let me live here. Excuse me. Let me live here when I get older. And I was like, of course. I was like, he's like, I want to be here when I get older. I was like, yeah, totally. Like, we'll do it. And that was the last time he was there. And he drove off for college. And then a week later, my dad called me and said, uh, I'm going to sell the house. I'm not going to rent it. So he was never planning to rent it. It was just a way to get everybody out because my mom still lived there. At the time, that was part of their divorce agreement. He was going to pay for the mortgage while my brother was home. It was just his way of getting everybody out so he could, you know, do the one last thing, which was the house and that was just uh 
horrible. It was so sad. And again, I couldn't get mad at him because he's he said, uh, I'll, I'm going to take the money and it's going to go towards um, you and your brother. And I'm going to take that money from the house and I'm going to invest it in these some type of real realtor venture. I don't know what it was, but it was all just BS because I'm never going to see a dime of any of that. And I don't care anyways, because it was just more about the memories that my brother and my mom and I had at those houses. It was more of that than any part of him. Cause again, he wasn't really around too much, but like, it just felt like he, he knew how, close we all were and how we still spent time there and he didn't want any of that to exist anymore and he took it all away so your dad is really doing a massive reset right here and he eventually starts dating someone new who is also not the best person in the world and when you go to visit him one time, as you wrote to me, there were, was this picture frame that you got your uh, dad with uh, pictures of you and your brother in it. And when you get there, there are no pictures of you and your brother in this frame anymore. And it is now his new partner and kids in, in there, the, the stepkids uh, in this frame. And you wrote to me that this was really just gut wrenching to see this. And it was like how you kind of didn't exist in a way anymore. Like this reset had happened. And then you have an experience where you find out uh, about your dad's original affair from when you are uh, a kid and you come to a very big realization. So walk us through that. I find out about it funny enough because my mom and I get a reading from a psychic medium and he brings up something about my dad having an affair when the kids are younger. And I like look over to my mom and she's kind of nodding her head no to the medium to kind of sh- like don't bring this up and he's like oh okay okay like he gets it like I don't know about this but then after the reading I asked my mom like is that true did he have an affair and she says yes he doesn't tell me the full details about it but when I learn about this I'm just thinking you know all these excuses of he can't spend enough time with us as kids he's too busy working somehow is able to have time to have a full affair with someone else and, you know, be seeing some other person, be spending time with them when he can't even apparently have enough time to be with his family. So it's kind of just eating at me. I, I'm just, I had been going through something similar within a relationship where I got cheated on and he was trying to console me about that. But then that just feels fake after learning about all this. So I went to him and I confronted him about it. I just said, hey, I need to talk to you about something. I want to know what happened. And I feel like I deserve to have an answer. And did you have an affair like with mom when I was younger growing up? And that's why you guys got separated. And he just, his mask fully slipped off, you know, that, that any type of appearance he was trying to keep up with me a bit to seem like a better person than he was just fully came off in that instance. And, you know, just go straight to the defensive mode of, I had reason to, I did it. There were reasons why I did that. I did that. And I'm just, I'm just sitting there in shock and disbelief. And I, I became so furious and I was just saying, well, what is your reason? Why did you cheat? Did, did mom cheat on you? He's like, no. I'm like, why, what possible reason could you have to do that? He's like, just because there, there were reasons why I did it. I'm like, well, fine. And I get all my stuff. I'm packing up. And I say to him, I'm like, you know what? You and your family, you can't ever talk about anything. I bring up anything. I come to you just trying to talk, discuss something. I didn't even come to you like in an angry tone. And you just can't even handle that at all. And he's like, well, 
you know, your mom's family is not great. Like I didn't even bring that up. You know, it's just always something to deflect defensive, whatever, anything that's going to take the heat off of him. And I'm like, whatever. I grab my puppy. I get my stuff. I go over to my mom's house is before we had sold the house. And I'm just, you know, just livid, like just the, the audacity of him, you know, to be so furious with me telling him the truth about something he did like, and, and I'm also holding back all my rage and anger I have towards him. I'm not even telling him how much he disgusts me, how, how infuriating that is that he would waste all that time when he could have been spending time with his kids, which he is not capable of. I just told him the truth and he lost his mind. Like the audacity of me to, to hold up the mirror to him and say, Hey, you did this thing. It, <laughs> I want to talk about it. You know, he just couldn't handle that. So eventually you uncover some repressed memories of sexual abuse at the hands of another a family member. And this is where you truly find out what kind of person your dad really is and what kind of family uh, your dad's side of the family uh, really is and, and who you are really dealing with. So uh, walk us through through this. You know, maybe a few years after I have the fight with my dad about, or the confrontation with him rather about his affair, but around that same time, maybe a few years later, I start to suffer from a lot of anxiety and I'm in, I've been in therapy my whole life, pretty much since my parents have been separated, but I've been in therapy on and off from a very young age. And um, during this time while I'm in therapy, I'm starting to remember that there has been some abuse that I had really, um, you know, just completely, my mind really blacked it out to where I didn't even remember it up until this point. But when I was 14 years old, I was sexually abused by a cousin on my dad's side. Um, this cousin is the son of my dad's sister who was in the divorce pact with him, you know, a buddy buddy with him. That's her son. And so this starts to come up in therapy and I'm obviously having a lot of anxiety around this because my mind's thinking, how am I going to, survive in this family now that I'm becoming aware of this there's no way I can confront this because people lose their minds over somebody forgetting to bring ketchup to a family dinner so certainly if I bring up the fact that someone has been sexually abusive and is a predator in the family that is going to be you know the biggest the biggest no-no of all but I don't want to live pretending that this hasn't happened. And eventually I'm hoping to get to the point where I could still be around other family members without having to be around this person. Cause I don't feel like it's fair that they could do something like that to me. And then I have to just deal with it and never, you know, say anything about it or, you know, be fine with them being around me, which I'm not. And so I start to tell a few people, like my mom, I tell friends, I eventually tell my dad, um, his initial response is just, oh, you know, that part of the family is so fucked up. Like his sister, my cousin, that was, that was just his initial response. So I'm like, okay, got this off my chest. And we're slowly kind of taking, we're going at his pace of what he feels like this should be how we should tell the rest of the family. Because again, I'm terrified. You know, I already feel like I can't speak my mind about most things. This is something where it speaking it into existence around them is terrifying. It's very scary. And so the first steps are he confronts my cousin. And by confronts, as he's talking to me about how he's going to do it, he's like, well, you know, it's important we tell him that we love him too. And I'm thinking in my mind, I don't love him. The cousin who abused me thinks his, 
he thinks that I don't know because I was asleep when it happened and he didn't know that I woke up and then kind of pretended that I wasn't awake so that, you know, I could protect myself and then remove myself from that situation and then, you know, blocked it out past the point. So he doesn't, that cousin that abused me doesn't know that I know he's just gone this whole time, you know, thinking he got away with whatever he did. And my dad talks to him. I had, I had kind of written out what I wanted him to say, which was just don't be around her at events. Like just, just don't, but I love you tells him just very strange. So some events go by, you know, we're trying to carry on this way and it's just, completely eating me alive I'm having panic attacks leading up to events let them, and then at events you know just feels like I'm in a constant panic a constant panic attack because it's just extremely stressful and I just get to a breaking point where I say I don't want to keep this a secret I don't want to keep canceling on other people in my family that I want to be around because I can't tell them what's happening because this person is going to be there And so I say, you know what, I'm just going to, I'm going to say it. I'm going to tell it. I'm going to come forward about it. I'm going to talk about it. I tell one of my cousins, my older cousins, who seems supportive, says, you know, like, we've got your back. He's more supportive than my dad. It's seeming that I'm kind of establishing some type of group that's, I'm trying to find people to protect me. I'm trying to say, I can't confront this entire family dynamic by myself. I can need people to like, help me out. And I don't know what the response is going to be. You know, it's just a scary thing to talk about. But once my cousin's mom finds out, so the cousin that abused me, once his mom finds out, she's just a monster to me. She's can't, can't believe the audacity of me saying, I don't want him around me. And Even then, even though I was saying, like, I don't want him to talk to me, this is already beyond what I feel comfortable with. If I could say fully what I don't want and what I feel comfortable with to this family, if I could say it, I don't ever want to see him again. I don't want him around me. I don't want him anywhere near me because it's just disgusting. And so last kind of event we have is this huge family reunion that happens every four years on my dad's side of the family. and. At this point, a few cousins know, my brother knows, my dad knows, and against my wishes, they start to tell all the siblings, you know, so this, this becomes like a sibling issue. It becomes something they feel like they need to handle where it's just, you know, apparently I'm creating all this issue by bringing this up and they just need to figure out how to fix it because in their minds, it's not okay that I'm saying he can't be around me and you know in my mind I'm saying I would hope that I wouldn't have to lose out on seeing the family that I love and care about the people I like being around because of what he did to me but they made it very clear that um I was the villain in that situation that you know, I was causing all this trouble by bringing this issue to light and standing my ground and having, God forbid, having boundaries for once in my life. That was too much for them to handle to where it became issue number one. And, uh, you know, that whole reunion was just a mess. I, there was an event going on every day and me and my brother and my cousin and his wife and my brother's girlfriend stayed behind to avoid my other cousin, the one who had abused me. And they were kind of tiptoeing over it and staying away from him, but he's like pushing boundaries and he's coming into my cabin and he's like standing there like a freak, like looking at me and then he leaves. So he's obviously someone who doesn't respect boundaries you know, otherwise he wouldn't have abused someone like that. So it's already very uncomfortable. And in the meantime, while all this is going on, I see my dad like hanging out with him, like high-fiving him, the cousin that abused me, acting like nothing happened, like having the best time with him. And it's just the most disgusting, infuriating thing I've ever seen, you know? 
it's almost like I told everybody what happened and they all just shrugged and said, huh? So what? Like, that's a normal Tuesday in this family because I, I come to find out that there has been more abuse that's gone on this family before me. My dad's older brother sexually assaulted his sister who was very, very young. And this has been a secret that's been very hush hush, but somehow everyone is seeming to find out about. And so the sister that got sexually abused by my uncle, she is the mother of the cousin that sexually abused me. And so it's just like, they feel like by me saying this, I'm bringing up that. And they can't let that come out because a lot of people don't know about that. And apparently she's moved on and she doesn't have a problem with it. And it's fine. And it's, it's just insane to be in that environment and to know that this is so wrong, to know that you're in the right and what you're doing is right by standing up for yourself. But then everyone in that family is like pointing the finger of blame at you and being like, you, you are the bad person. You would think, you would think that I did this to somebody for, for, for how horrible this is. It's like the way I'm being treated. You would think that I abuse somebody like this when I'm just speaking out about it, but they can't handle the fact that I'm uncomfortable around him. And it's, and it's just infuriating because again, if, if I were stating exactly how I feel and what I wanted, it would look so different from all this and they can't even take that. And so I leave the reunion. And then I learned too, that my aunt, she is now starting the smear campaign against me saying that I told him um, not to come to my grandfather's funeral, who had just died, that I told him not to go see him on his deathbed. Um, I didn't say any of that stuff. In fact, I was being way too, you know, co- coerced into being so lenient around him. But even if I wanted to, so what? Like, so what if I had said all that? But it was just infuriating because I had already push down all my boundaries so much let them take care of this let let them handle the situation you know whatever way it needed to be when I was so uncomfortable having panic attacks all the time so just hearing that you know kind of just sent me over the edge I was like this is just ridiculous you know trying to trying to paint me into the bad guy in any way I can't any way that they can because I'm the one telling the truth and their whole foundation you know is built on lies so they have to take any type of extreme measure, make me out to be look like a liar or, you know, whatever. Um, and so I try and talk to my dad about this. So I say, you know, dad, I feel really uncomfortable with, with, with what went down at the reunion. Um, the way your siblings were doing that felt really horrible. And he says, you know, no, they didn't do anything wrong. Like they're just, um, they're protecting, you know, they're just trying to protect him. They're trying to do this. I'm like, what What are you talking about? Like, you're insane. Like you're absolutely insane. But I can't get through to him at all. And I even had one of my other aunts call me. This is the same aunt that, you know, at Thanksgiving a while back was like, you need to talk to your dad because you need to forgive him all this she texted me after the reunion and she said, um, I love you. I know like there's been some stuff going on. I'm here if you want to talk. So again, I'm like, Oh, maybe this will be another person, you know, looking, I'm looking for some maybe adult to be like, Hey, you know, this is wrong. This is what needs to happen. So I end up calling her and I, am you know, just trying to explain myself and it quickly turns into, um, you know, it's, well, it's not, fair that you asked him not to be at that event and then his mom felt uncomfortable and she wasn't there and so this is that's just not very fair and I'm like well I don't really care because he assaulted me so it's not really about making people feel comfortable when I've been made to feel very uncomfortable for so long and um she starts to say well you know my son did something very similar to someone and I had to forgive him I was just like taken aback. I'm like, what? I, I, I didn't know how to respond to that. I was just very frozen. 
and what she was telling me, because especially because her text sounded so inviting and welcoming. And really, it was just a trick. But what is she even talking about? Wasn't her son arrested for something? He was in jail for some time, but we never talked about that. I looked it up um, and he is a registered sex offender. And this is another thing in my family where we just have never talked about. So I didn't even know about this at the time where I'm talking to her. So now we, now we have cousin who abused me. We have this other cousin who got arrested, who is a registered sex offender. Then we have my uncle who abused my aunt. So we have three known predators in this family that everyone is just coddling and acting like nothing happens. This is fine. So the very you know, last straw I start to have with my dad is I, I confront him about how I didn't like the way he reacted at the reunion. And I say, this is around this next Christmas time. The reunion was in summer and Christmas comes around and I'm not going because I don't want to deal with all this again. But I know he's there with the cousin that abused me. And so after Christmas, I just, I text him and I say, hey, um, you know, it makes me feel really uncomfortable that you are just going on like nothing happened. At the end of it, I put, I love you because I thought maybe that will diffuse it a little bit. Again, once again, every time I've talked to him, I'm diluting everything I feel. There's so much rage behind. I'm trying to like minimize it. And, you know, I say the situation too with your brother and sister, not ever having that abuse addressed is like, probably why this is such a huge deal and stuff and his response was you don't know what you're talking about I did everything right um that situation with my brother and sister has nothing to do with this um you're very wrong you know blah 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 I'm a great dad I did everything perfect you don't know what you're talking about and I saw in my hand was just shaking and I was like, you know what? This is it. This is the this is the last, 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 last straw of so many times where I've just been completely at the end of my rope with this insanely evil person that is my father. And I just said, you know what? I'm done. I'm done. Never gonna deal with this again. And I blocked him and that was the last time I ever spoke to my dad and I will never speak to him again. And that was the end for me right there. So how has your healing process been since you've gone no contact? After, you know, after I initially stopped talking to him, my lease was up in August and I had already been looking to move out of state. I just wanted to be out of the area I had grown up in my whole life. And, um, So my mom and I did move a few months later. We moved out of state and has not been perfect. There have been a lot of areas that have been very scary. So I'm not going to try and minimize that and make it seem like it's all sunshine rainbows, but not having to deal with that family dynamic and not having to deal with my dad has been the biggest blessing that's ever happened to me in my entire life because you start to realize like, oh, I've, I've been in survival mode my entire life. Like, I, I don't know what not being in survival mode looks like. Like that's my whole life has been that. And so that feels a bit uncomfortable breaking out of at first because it's scary, um, to go into a feeling you don't know, like your nervous system is just used to fight or flight. You're like always waiting for the other foot to drop because, you know, the narcissist is going to be so, they can be, you mask for a little bit and be kind for the part of the cycle, but then, you know, it's going to get bad again. And so not having to deal with that is such a relief. It's insane. Like, I didn't know life could be like this. I didn't know, you know, there's so many things, so much part of my personality was like tied in with trauma responses and just, um, being having to be a people pleaser where now I'm just like, I just want to do whatever I want because I want to be happy and I want to do what I like and take my time and know that I'm not lazy. You know, I'm, I'm, I'm very, 
I'm the opposite of lazy and all these things that they've told me my whole life. Um, I'm smart and capable. It's a lot of things I have to keep telling myself because a lot of that negative voice that I thought was mine for so long, that perfectionism, I've learned that was a lot of them. That was a lot of what they projected onto me. And as easily as I've taken that on, I'm learning like I can let I can let go of that. I don't have to hold on to that anymore. That wasn't serving me. That wasn't serving them. They're pretty miserable people. They can't have fun playing games. <laughs> they can't have fun playing Candyland. Everything is just so serious and so intense. And there's no space to enjoy life and just breathe and be yourself and um, just like live life, you know? You're ha- you had to, I had to live life so long for so many other people that now I get to live for myself. And it's just, it feels very free. It's been hard a lot of days. I went to a rage room and that has helped me so much because I have so much internalized rage, obviously, for things that I'll never be able to say to people who won't ever hear me. Uh, but going to a rage room felt so awesome <laughs> to just be able to get angry and not get made fun of or being told I'm angry for nothing because I'm. I have so much to justify, you know, that anger is very real. So that that's a lot of, a lot of things to sum up your question. But uh, in general, I feel like that song, Top of the World, <laughs> just like, not a cloud in the sky, not the sun in my eye, like <laughs> just very nice, you know, kind of feels like a dream a little bit. I'm like, I didn't know life could be, <laughs> life is always going to have its challenges, but with that many narcissist people around you it just it feels like you can't do anything right and so when you're free from it and with the clarity I've gained from leaving them I just feels more like a bright sunny day for the most part compared to how my life felt before for the most part and if you have any words of wisdom or advice for people listening what would it be my advice to anyone would just be um I don't know. I I find ways of coping with it by watching a lot of fictional movies. I love Harry Potter. I think there's a lot of narcissism, you know, kind of metaphors woven into a lot of fictional stuff where maybe people needed an outlet to deal with the narcissist in their life because they're just intolerable and you can't ever get any type of clarity or closure with them. You just have to leave, you know, if you can. And I know it's difficult because some people, you know, remain around people and family systems. And I get that, but for me, it feels really, feels really good. Not ever having to deal with them ever again. It feels like I kind of escaped a waking nightmare. And now I just get to spill all the beans with them on a podcast about surviving <laughs> narcissistic abuse. So yeah, <laughs> it's a lot of things, but do you feel like you're the boy who lived? Oh my God. I, you know what I've said? I'm like, they need another Harry Potter where it's just like the aftermath of all of that. Like Harry Potter and the long therapy session because that was just way too much. Yeah. I, a lot of times I feel like Harry Potter, especially that scene, you know, um, Prisoner of Azkaban where he's kind of looking for his dad to come save him, you know? He thinks his dad cast that Patronus and Hermione's there. And he's like, Harry, he's not coming. Like, it needs to be you. Like, you've got to save yourself. And I feel like I did that. (laughs) I feel like I was looking for other people to come help me. And they didn't. And it's really sad that I didn't have that as a kid. And I'm still very sad about that. But, like, I came through and I was like, expect no Patronum. (laughs) Like, heck no. Like, I'm done with this. Like. I really did save myself because I would have died there. I could not, I could not be there amongst all those death eaters and <laughs> Voldemort and all that. <laughs> I couldn't do that anymore. So yeah. <laughs> well, Rhea, I'm happy you were here today and, and that you told your story. Not an easy story to tell. Um, I know you're exhausted right now. Yeah. Um, 
but a really big thank you for sharing your story and helping so many people feel uh, less alone in validating their experience and their life. And you did a, a really good job today. So from me and everyone, um, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And if you want to be a guest on our show like Rhea was today, please do go to our website at NarcissistApocalypse.com. Top of the page, there's a button that says Guest Form. When you click on that button, it takes you to our Guest Form page. Please read all the instructions and either send us an email at NarcissistApocalypse at gmail.com or fill out our Guest Form and press the Submit button. Please do send it to us, your email or your submission in the format that we ask for. And also at our website, we have our very own support group. So if you need support, we have our very own safe social network. When you click on that support group button at our website, it takes you to the social network that we have. We have Zoom meetings on there every Wednesday night, Thursday afternoon, and Saturday night. We have forum boards for you to post on and for your peers, the people that are going through the exact same thing, your, your fellow survivors to, to help you and guide you through whatever you are going through. Also on there, we have ad-free episodes and episodes that never made it to air. So if you need support, please join our support group today. And if you need even more support, please do visit our friends at DomesticShelters.org. They have articles and resources to help you make sense of what you are going through. And if you need phone numbers and websites of every shelter and domestic violence agency, wherever you are, how big or small, whatever town you are in, please do go visit DomesticShelters.org today. It is a free resource. It's a wonderful organization. So please do visit domesticshelters.org. And that is it for today's episode, for today's story. A big thank you to Rhea once again. And from Rhea and myself, we hope you have a good night.